I have duly considered the submissions of counsel, and I must commend the candor, wit, and erudition displayed. In imposing sentence on the accused persons, the court has noted the fact that in changing their pleas, valuable time and resources have been saved and its evidence of remorse and common sense. A balance must, however, be arrived at by the court in ensuring that not only is the financial element which induces and motivates this class of offenses is taken care of, but also impose sanctions that signal that crime does not pay. It is indeed sad that the activities of the accused persons not only led to a collapse of the bank in a foreign country, but also brought mysteries to many innocent people. The accused persons is hereby sentenced as follows. Welcome back to 23419, a true crime podcast about advanced fee fraud, popularly known as 419 in Nigeria. This is the concluding episode of this season as we tell the full story of the biggest fraud case committed in Nigerian history and the rise of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. I thought it was going to be like five episodes, but I ran out of money, so you'll have to compress the rest in this episode. It's going to run a bit longer, but will be fun. Enjoy the ride. The 409 scam comes in many shapes and sizes. It sometimes arrives as an appeal to rich Westerners to come to the aid of an impoverished African child. Or the lovelorn, you know, in particular middle-aged widows and divorcees who develop virtual relationships. But most of all, the 419ers appeal to the basic instinct of greed. This is a work of creative nonfiction. While the story is inspired by actual persons and events, certain characters, characterizations, incidents, locations, and dialogue were fictionalized or invented for purposes of dramatization. The events depicted took place between 1995 and 2005. My name is Choma, and this is 23419. Chief Emmanuel Woody, Odinigwe, Zenozo. Emmanuel Odinigwe Nwude was a highly respected man in his community. He was wealthy, successful, fashionable, charismatic. He had a way with people and was extremely generous. He started out his business empire with the sale of electronics, then vehicle spare parts, and he went into bureau to change operations. However, by the year 2000, he was the director and largest shareholder in Union Bank, one of the biggest banks in Nigeria at the time. I met with Emmanuel Ngude to get his side of the story. I really did meet up with him, guys. We had dinner. This is true. Yes, uh, this uh, issue, this my matter between 
was between 2000 and uh, it actually started 2003, mainly. I had a friend, my late friend, called uh, Chikaika in the chamber. I deal on brew the church, that brother business. So he called me and told me, and made a request if I can give him an account number, which uh, I did. African shelter brew the church. Later, I was he said if I had that I say, what do you say? He wants to make a transfer. The phone will come in that I will buy it. I say yes. So we made one or two transactions, which came in. And when the money comes in, I will go and get it from my bank. Then I make a draft for him. Then I take my commission. So we're doing it, doing it. He said uh, if I could give him more account number. Give him another account number, just like that. About two, three account number. We do the business and collecting my my profit. Did you ever meet Nelson Sakaguchi? Do I know him? No, never met him in my life. I've never met Sakaguchi. I've never met Sakaguchi. I don't know who Sakaguchi. The transaction was between him and Anajemba. What happened to Christian Ikechuku and Anajemba? It's um, a very hired assassin. Was killed on his way back to Enugu along the road. After going to his hometown, the night was was killed. Because when I was, somebody was telling me that the assassins were. There's a rumor that Olusegun Obasanjo, the then president of Nigeria, was visiting Enugu State. He saw an elaborate construction underway and he thought it was a federal government project. So when he was told that it was to be a private residence, he was wondering who the hell could afford this kind of project. So he went back to base in Abuja and set up the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. In 2003, the EFCC led by Nuhuri Badu had secured an arrest warrant for Imara Lumbodi. But when they got to his home, they couldn't get access. He had a state-of-the-art security system complete with bulletproof doors. No matter how hard we tried, my officers couldn't hack it down. The only way was to shoot it down, but when we got access, he was nowhere in sight. Imara Unwede didn't concur to this side of the story. I remember something, I think May or so. I traveled and uh, he said, uh, a group of policemen visit my house at uh, four hours when we go in. My house help called me. I said, please tell them I'm not there. So later he called me and said, there are so many. Uh, they came with uh, about uh, three, three vans, pickup vans, mobiles, MTL, uh, and He said, let me speak to one of them. I spoke to one of them, I said, please, I'm not in. Keep your address, when I come, I will come. I said, okay, when I come, I should come. Where am I? I showed him uh, that I traveled to Patako. So when I came, I, I didn't see any car in my compound again. They took the whole of my car, the whole of my cars. They said they picked uh, my children. So the office letter, they brought them back. Then I have to. I didn't know where the office is. Trying to, I went and consulted my lawyer. My lawyer was trying to say yes. There's this new commission they just uh, inaugurated. That they say they are in EFCC. I mean that they are EFCC. Where are they? I don't know. So that was why we'll be making contacts. Eventually, somebody said that he will escort me to Abuja. Now you believe they have the office. So I went to the office. 
one presidential um, presidential office, Julia Swan's office. I don't think they said uh, he's the chairman. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. My turn, when it got to my turn, I went into the office. I introduced myself. The man shot. I said, I'm Chief Mude. He said, ah, Chief Mude. He said, where are you from? I said, I traveled. I understand you have always come to my house. That was why I'm here. Man he left his kidney there. I went, to his, went out for about three minutes. He came back because he was shocked to see me. He said, well, um, that I'm a gentleman. But uh, in as much as I did so that uh, he would treat me as a gentleman. That what happened, that uh, he would give me, he picked two statement form and gave me. He said that I should go with it and make statement and come to work. I said, okay. But if I give me his number, if I find anything difficult, I should call him. Somebody to, he would send somebody to assist me. I said, okay. Then I went. Nwode had a lot more to say. I flew all the way from Lagos to this Abuja. Gave me to one, one picker so. They say the former minister was living there. They call him, uh, they call him uh, uh, Lima. They call him uh, uh, Lima. So, uh, I was there. Getting the midnight, he, around 11 in the night, he came. He asked me how I was uh, how I'm feeling. I said, I'm feeling fine. He said, what are you eating? I said, uh, they've not brought any food for me. He said, OK. He said, what happened is, uh, uh, what about uh, Tafa Balogu? Tafa Balogu then was the Inspector General of Police. I said, I said, well, it's fine. I said, friend, I said, it's fine. So there's one thing I want you to do. You open the newspaper and brought sheet. I brought a two sheet of, uh, a one sheet of, uh, of uh, writing part. So I should write that I gave Tafa Balu $300,000. So I said that I gave him $300,000. He said, no, just try that I gave him $300,000. Then I asked him, uh, why? He said, no, just write it. If you just write it, just two sentences that, uh, that uh, you will, when you show it to Baba, you will let me go. So, that I should write that I gave him $300,000. I said, why, why should I write so? I said, I just know him as um, just a friend, he's general of police, and that's all. He hasn't done anything for me that warrant me giving him such amount of money. That time. Yes. He said, no, that I should just write it. Huh? I told him that I find it difficult to do so. So, okay, don't worry. Um, just write it. I will uh, come tomorrow. Don't give it to anybody. He'll come and pick it. He gave me his three telephone numbers. He gave me his private room. He says, as soon as I finish, I should call him. I said, okay. He helped. Don't worry about the, uh, the chairman. Don't worry about it. I don't even know him as the chairman. I just called him. Don't worry about it. So he left. The following day, he came again. Around uh, almost the same time. Yeah, this one, this one is late. It should be around 12. He came, uh, as you said, uh, this. And I didn't know what to write. I just wrote uh, just a few lines, how I entered politics, how I sponsored people. You know, he said, no, this is not what I asked you to write. Just cancel it. Right, just write that I gave him 
Now, 200,000, if 300,000 is good, I should just write 200,000. I said, look, I said, no, how can I write? If I, okay, let's assume I give you money. I said, friend, then I'll go and write that I gave you money. He said, no, just write it. I said, no, I'm an evil man, I can't do that. He said, just write, just try to force me to write. And I said, no, I can't write it. He said, I said, okay, what are you going to do with it? He said, yes, if I just take this and I show it to Baba, he will, the moment I know that Baba likes black men, listen to me, that that means they're Obasanjo. He said, Obasanjo likes black men. That the moment I show him, he will ask me to go. I told him, no, I can't do it. I said, police will kill me. Suppose I write it to this man, he said, no, I'll give you protection. Believe me, God, and man. That, that was what he said. He took the paper, tore the paper, called them that, uh, that nobody should bring food for me. Nobody should come and visit me here. I begin to wonder. I said, look at you. My mind just tell me, look, you've entered problem. You brought yourself a problem. Then I started regretting why did I come and see him? That's, that's the beginning of the matter. He tried to bribe me. He tried twice. That was what he came to see me for. Not because he wanted to clear his name, but because he wanted to bribe me. You see, Emmanuel Ungude bribed me through his lawyer. He arranged with his lawyer and offered me a first tranche of £21,000. This transaction was recorded unknown to Ungude and his lawyer. After a while, he sent me another amount, a second tranche of $75,000, about 10 million naira. I wouldn't say I blamed them for trying. I made sure to make him feel comfortable. I even advised him to come to the office to see how the investigation was going. And one of those days, they were arrested. We played all the videos of the evidence we had gathered and he was, he was very speechless. With all the suspects in custody, the case went to court. At this time, William Ritchie and his team had come to Nigeria. Their goal, though, was to help retrieve the money stolen from the Banco Noriesti families. All rise for the Honorable Justice Oyewole of the Nigerian High Court. Clark, call the case. Charge number ID 92C04, the case between the Federal Republic of Nigeria versus Emmanuel Umudi, Amaka Anajamba, Nzeribe Ede Okoli, Pembas Nigeria Limited, Amruz Nigeria Limited, Ocean Oil Marketing Nigeria Limited, African Shelter Bureau Limited. The prosecution had a number of witnesses against the accused persons. Most of them were people who laundered money for the team, and some were people they bought properties from. So they worked hard in tracking down the launderers, and in exchange for little to no jail time, they agreed to testify against Emmanuel Kumude and Amaka Anajemba. One of the witnesses was a Mr. Swarin. Who is here for the prosecution? Road to me, Jacobs, my lord. Call your first witness. I call on Mr. Suarez. Please tell us about your relationship with the defendant. In 1991, there was a problem in Ikeja branch of Equatorial Trust Bank. I was sent to normalize things there since the manager moved out and to restore customer confidence in the bank. I gave instructions to my officers that any person withdrawing above 500,000 Naira should see me in person. Chief Wunde came to withdraw 500,000 during that time. And after pleasantries, I asked him the nature of his business. 
he told me he was a distributor of tires and Veku spare parts. That was how the relationship started. Anytime he came to the bank, we, he calls on me to say hello. What was the nature of his account? He had four accounts. One as Ezim Wamadu. Second, a personal account as Emmanuel Mude. Third account as Ima. And the fourth one, African Shelter Nigerian Limited. Those four accounts, can you tell the courts the kind of currency the accounts deal with? Naira, dollar? They were all Naira accounts. Can you cast your mind back to 1995 and tell the court what you know about the first accused? Around 1994, I moved from the Ikeja branch of ETB. By 1995, Chief Wunde came to me. He told me since I left the branch, he is now into oil business and he has some foreign exchange to sell to ETB. He requested for a correspondent bank account of ETB abroad. A request which was handled by the head of office who asked Chief Wode to come down to Victoria Island to collect the particulars. After some time, he brought ETB checks and he told me the bank had been assisting him to change his foreign exchange into Naira. What did you do with the checks? Some he collected cash over the counter, others he paid into his account. The money he paid into his accounts, what did he do with it? He issued checks through third parties to collect money. I cannot remember the third parties now. I visited the office in VI and on two occasions I saw Mude sitting outside the general manager's office looking dejected. When I asked him the problem, he told me he had been experiencing delay in getting the Naira equivalent of the foreign exchange amount that he brought into the bank. He said he had been coming for the past one week to no avail. He expressed disappointment over the treatment and asked me to get him a good and responsible customer who needs Forex. At that time in my branch, ETB had an Indian customer. The name of the account is Royal Crest Nigeria Limited. The account belonged to the owner, Narish Asnani Jr., and was supervised by the company GM, Mr. Damindra. The company deals in household products and electronics. $1 million was lodged into Royal Crest account, and Mude met Asnani Sr. before the Naira equivalent was paid, which I collected on his behalf. Suarez, a suspect arrested by the EFCC, later turned persecution witness, confessed to have moved foreign currencies totaling $10.1 million on behalf of Umwude. Suarez gave a detailed description of how $1 million was lodged into Royal Crest accounts and how Umwude met Asnani Sr. He spoke about a delay in the payment of the Naira value of a second tranche of Forex involving the sums of $1.25 million and $850,000 paid by Umwude into the Royal Crest account, which led to the accused asking for an alternative Forex buyer. So the prosecution had another witness. It was a forensic investigator from the States, Logan James, who works with William Ritchie. My name is Logan James. I work with the FBI. I am a forensic investigator. Can you tell us what you discovered during the course of your investigation? When Sakaguchi was suspected of making the unauthorized SWIFT transfers, he tried to posture himself as a well-meaning bank employee who had the best interest of the bank at heart in making transfers. This posturing involved Sakaguchi submitting documents he claimed that he received from the then unrecognized fraudsters instructing him to wire funds. Those documents were faxed to Sakaguchi, ostensibly from the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, 
This evidence shows that those documents faxed to Sakaguchi were actually sent by Emmanuel Nwade. How was he identified as the sender of the faxes? Unbeknownst to Nwade, the faxes identify him as the instructing party impersonating His Excellency, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Because they contain his electronic fingerprint, the fax headers printed automatically by the sender's fax machine. On documents faxed to Sakaguchi show that it was Emmanuel Nwade who sent them. Bank records produced in Switzerland show that Odenigwe sent bank instructions to his Swiss bankers from the same fax machine. In addition, bank telephone records show that Sakaguchi called telephone number 234-90-500-651 over 1,300 times. 134 of these calls connected and lasted over two minutes. This telephone number was Nwade's cellular number at the time. Specifically, Ms. Rosemary Eliansi testified in her declaration submitted in support for this motion for summary adjudication that on June 5th, 1997, with the money wire transferred to Celebrity Escrow Corp, I purchased in my name for Nwade, the Lasky and Robbins properties for US $2,875,000. Later that same day, I called Nuade to his cellular number 234-90-500-651 and talked to him for a few minutes. But is this enough proof to show that he influenced Sakaguchi to make those transfers? It is thus clear that Sakaguchi and Nuade were in constant communication with each other in connection with and during the time period spanning the conversations of the bank's funds. Indeed, the huge volume of telephone calls from Sakaguchi to Nuade during the time period shows the tight hold that Nuade had over Sakaguchi. Nuade's instructions to Sakaguchi during the time period of the misappropriations, Nuade's receipt of stolen funds, and the fact that he had no business with the bank shows that Nuade through his use of Sakaguchi, controlled the unauthorized movement of funds from the bank's accounts. Attention, attention please. There's a bomb threat in this courtroom and we have to conduct a sweep. Please, please, leave the courtroom in an orderly manner. On the 13th of September 2005, after the announcement of the bomb threats, there was a stampede. While Chief Unwode was being moved to the Black Maria van that brought him from the Koyi prison to the courthouse in Ikeja, the prosecution witness, Mr. Dio Ogunshe, a bank manager, was allegedly kidnapped by Umwode's prison wardens. I was grabbed from behind by the warden as I was entering my car to leave the court after the bomb threat announcement that day. My documents, my Nokia phone was seized and taken to Umwode, after which they bundled me into a Volkswagen private bus, part of the prison convoy. They drove us to Joel Ogunaike Junction, Ikeja, where I was dragged down and the guard started kicking me. One of the wardens even slapped me. Chief Umude asked me questions on my role in the trial. The boss stopped on the way for them to make photocopies of the documents seized from me. Okoli, the other defendant, brought a biro and paper and asked that I should write whatever he dictates, that I don't know Mr. Umude before and that I came to take his picture in court. Umude brought matches and asked me to burn the copies of the documents after he tore his passport copies and account opening documents, all, all, all the documents I had with me. Ibe, the prison warden, pushed me against the railing at Ted Milan Bridge and said he would throw me into the water. I was afraid, crying throughout. I was not interrogated at the prison. My documents and my camera were never returned to me. I've lost so much weight. I'm traumatized. I'm on leave. I've not come to court since that day. Uwode, however, claimed that his life was the one at risk. One day, I came to court. Around the court, used to sit around 9 in the morning. 
As soon as the court started the, their proceeding, I still, I still remember what happened. One person came and whispered to the, to the judge. All of us, because we are still in the dock. The judge just rise. What we had, an uh, announcement that everybody should vacate the court premises. Everybody should vacate the court premises. <laughs> we don't know what was happening. People were running helter skelter. We came out. <laughs> People were running helter skelter. We saw, I saw a bomb disposal uh, station, the van, with all their gadgets. From this day, told my friend. One spirit was talking to me. One spirit started talking to me. I should not run. I should not run. Don't run. I'm telling, I'm telling you. One spirit was talking to me. I should not run. I heard my friend. I said we should not run. I was talking to. Him. I didn't even know what I was doing. He was the one telling me later what I was doing. That I heard him said I said we should not run. Both my brothers, my in-laws, everybody. Gently, gently. When I when we were going down, my people, Uma Zanda, came and whispered to me. Say, spoke to me in answer. Where is my motor? Where is our motor? I said, our motor is. He said, I should run. Where people are running, he said, I should run. That spirit told me, don't run. That thing was telling me, don't run. We went gently till we came out to the gate where other people was. Not knowingly that they have set somebody with this long Nokia camera, brand new Nokia camera. And my hangouts were behind watching us as well, following us behind, we didn't know. So he saw this guy, his name is Dabo. One Boy, so snapping me, snapping us, following us behind. So when we came down to the gate, standing of us are standing, he called the guy. He said, Do you know Chief? He said, No. He said, But I saw you snapping him. Oh, he said, No, 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 they are making call. He said, We are making call. Because he saw him, he was watching, you know, this arm got uh, mobile. Yes. He saw him watching. You just collect the phone for him. Say, can any of you, anybody operate this uh, phone? Ah, no sharp voice. Mm -hmm. say, yeah. ka, ka, ka. Jesus, see my. Even when we came down from court, they were snapping us. <laughs> Do you know the plan? They purposely set that, that show so that if I mistakenly say I'm running, they will shoot themselves. They will shoot and say that I'm planning to run. Then they have planned to eliminate me. Thinking that when they come and tell me I should run. Like if, you're escaping. Yes, I, they will put it that I'm trying to escape. Then they will shoot. And then flash the tail, nobody knows. The one that was trying to run. The God said I should not run. When, my, when the mobile, the arm guard, the security man picked up God and discovered it, he said, but you say you don't know. Look at all my pictures, all my photographs. I said, okay, where is the van? Order the prison van to come, bus. And so everybody should go. Enter inside the van. They told him, we are taking you to a good. When you reach, you explain yourself. The moment we moved, getting to Isaac Jones, the boy started shivering. I started sweating and crying. Say, please, don't take me. They said, okay, identify yourself. He said, yes. That uh, Rotimi Jacob, Rotimi Jacob, the, the prosecutor, and uh, Omar Zander, and uh, the, 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 that they brought him. They used to come to AFCC. He was being trained on how to come and testify against me in the court. You get me? 
After Mr. Dio Wunshaya's testimony against Nwode and the senior prison warden, Inspector Cornelius Ibe, they were formally arraigned on five-count charge of perverting justice, kidnapping, assault, and abuse of office before a Lagos High Court, Ikeja. Nwode was also transferred from Ikoi prisons to Kirikiri. One key prosecution witness was Naresh Asnani, curly haired, 5'8, and of Indian nationality, along with his father. Together, they had laundered about $120 million of the money Sakaguchi sent to them through banks and businesses in India, China, Switzerland, and other countries. At the time Umude's case was going on, both father and son had been prosecuted in Switzerland for money laundering and had served their time. However, Naresh Asnani came to testify against Nwude in Nigeria. Mr. Naresh, what was your line of business? Our family company in Nigeria is Royal Crest Company. Our company in Nigeria is a wholeness company of uh, imported goods like electronics, building materials, batteries from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, with a turnover of $25 million per annum. And I made a profit of around 10 to 20% of set turnover. How did you meet the first defendant? The payment of goods purchased in Nigeria was made to my bank, Equatorial Trust Bank. Now, Mr. Suarez was my account manager and also the bank manager. Mr. Suarez introduced Mr. Wude to me as one of his old and important client. I had to buy about $2.5 million monthly to pay my suppliers abroad. Chief Emmanuel Wude informed my father and I in 1995 that an offshore company, Stanton Development Corporation, was used by him and his partners for the sale and receipt of proceeds from the oil export business. I contacted my clearing and forwarding agent, Mr. Peter Okocha, to find out whether the accused had any criminal record. Told him to inquire from the State Security Service, SSS, and uh, National Drug Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, Okocha confirmed that they had no criminal records. Describe your first meeting with Ms. Taungwude. At the time of our first meeting, we didn't know about the money. He just mentioned he had $1 million to sell to me in the presence of Mr. Suarez. For me, the exchange rate was better than the one in the bank, so I immediately accepted. He transferred the money straight to my account in Hong Kong, and I paid him the Naira equivalent. There was a shortage of dollars because the Central Bank of Nigeria had uh, restricted the sale of dollars. Mr. Asnani, what was your relationship with Mr. Anajemba? I never met Mr. Anajemba. I never had any business with him. With the instructions from Mr. Wude, I only released payments. He was on the list handed to me. I never asked any explanation for the payments, didn't know any relation between him and Anajemba. I read the press that Mr. Rana Jemba was assassinated in 1998 or 99. I don't really remember well. So what happened in Switzerland? Well, for income tax reasons, we didn't want to have all the money in Hong Kong. So we opened an account with World Bank in Zurich. We told our account officer, Mr. Wasmeer, that we were to receive dollar proceeds from all exports. At this point, Nigeria had granted crude oil contracts to private persons and I had seen Mr. Wude's filling stations. Now, when Mr. Wude asked us to refund part of the money and write to him into our account, this is in connection with money we hadn't used. I wasn't alarmed because he never asked me to hide his name. As Wude had more dollars that he needed for his business, he introduced some of his friends who had dollars to sell too. To invade tax, I had to move money through Swiss Bank for him. I received approximately $122 million in my account in Switzerland over the period. When did you realize there was a problem? That was in March 2001 when my account was frozen. I contacted Mr. Wasmeer and he said he didn't know exactly what was going on, but that I should appoint a lawyer. I went personally to Mr. Wude in order to know what the problem was. He told me he didn't understand what had happened, but just to appoint a good lawyer. But he didn't offer to pay for me. So I appointed a lawyer in Switzerland. He didn't have $5,000 to give us for the legal fees, even though he was living like a king. I had heard about the Nigerian fraud, but I wasn't expecting Mr. Wude to be a part of it. He had a big influence with the former and current government. 
you know his photographs were published with uh, president vice president ministers he even has a picture with the pope i honestly thought that they were into oil businesses because that was the only explanation why they had so much foreign currency i was judged and convicted by a swiss court in geneva for the funds i received by order of stanton development company and for laundering the funds that i received on instructions of chief wude in my accounts in switzerland i was not convicted for the approximately 6 million dollars that i received in my hong kong bank account at uco bank this judgment only relates to the approximately 122 million dollars that i received in my accounts in switzerland the judgment was given in french in the court at geneva and uh, communicated to me by an interpreter in english we didn't know that the money was from dubious means and when this came out we were not only jailed we were disgraced and shunned by the indian community in nigeria this testimony given by mr naresh asnani cuts doubts to christian anajemba being the mastermind as onwudi claimed naresh fingered imanuel onwudi and said that he had laundered over 120 million dollars for him At the end of his testimony, Naresh said he only met Christian Anajemba in person once before his death, and that was when he wrote a check for him on behalf of Mr. Onwudi. After that, he saw his obituary in the newspaper. Naresh also said that Emmanuel Onwudi used the phone in his house to make calls to Brazil, and this threw out Onwudi's argument that he had never met with or heard of Nelson Sakaguchi. I contacted Chief Emmanuel Onwudi when I learned my account had been used for fraud. He told me that he could not understand what was happening and that he was not aware of anything. A few months later, I received an email from his lawyer in Switzerland and it was in form of an affidavit with a clause that he did not know Naresh Asnani. I printed the email and rushed to his house at uh, Osborne Road and asked him how could he swear an affidavit denying me? But he denied knowing anything about it. In 2005 alone, the UltraScan Advanced Global Investigations reported that citizens in 38 developed countries admitted to losses of over 3 billion dollars from fraud alone. The prosecution had yet another witness to present, but the defense didn't know who it was. <coughs> Mr. Rotimi Jacobs, call your next witness. I call Nelson Sakakuchi to the stand. Oda, Oda. <clears throat> My lord, in light of the new witness, we would like to ask for an adjournment to prepare for the questioning of this witness. We brought Nelson Sakaguchi from Brazil. Um our client's interest wasn't the prosecution of these people. The Nigerian government was interested in having them prosecuted and and uh, convicted but the concern of the clients was to get their money back. So after both Anajemba and um, Wude were arrested we engaged in negotiations with them through their counsel and um we reached uh, an agreement with Mrs Anajemba at an early stage and she agreed to pay i think it was 50 million dollars to the clients and um we told the EFCC this and the EFCC then agreed to reduce the charges against her and they reduced the charges against her she pled guilty to the reduced charges and was convicted and sentenced to terms of imprisonment wude was a little not a, a a lot tougher so he wouldn't go along um he he wouldn't agree he he offered 20 million and we said you know 20 million won't work then later he upped it to 40 and we said no 40 won't work um has to be 80 and um he said no Then when we produced Nelson Sakaguchi Nelson Sakaguchi walked into the court they then asked for an adjournment of the case and they said they wanted to settle and they spoke to us and they said they would pay 80 million and we said no 
that you now have to pay 120. You know, um, I always remember Bill Ritchie saying to, to, to uh, Mr. Ngude's lawyers, said, the train is leaving the station. You know, so you better get on it. If you don't get on the train, you're going to miss it. So w when they were offering 40, we said 80, and they said no. We said, well, you know, you're going to miss the train. And that's what happened. They missed the train. And by the time they were ready to pay, it was $120 million was, was the price. And he agreed to that, and he signed an agreement with us, and we told the court. And the court, um, the EFCC then reduced the charges against him as well. And um, he was convicted. And he, I remember he got, he got five years. The first accused is hereby sentenced to five years imprisonment without the option of five for count one to five. All sentences shall run concurrently and shall commence from 4th of June 2003 when he had been in custody. Accused persons shall forfeit the sum of $110 million to the victims of the fraud and $10 million to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. On, uh, when I went back to Kiriki, then I was now coming from Kiriki to court every day. Great Major Corp came to. No, no, no. When I was, when verdict was, when judgment, when they delivered the judgment. Because in the judgment, before the judgment, they came and said that uh, I should. Then I wasn't feeling fine. Said that I should do. That I should do. I should do plea bargain. I said, what is plea bargain? They said, they tacked everything, tacked everything, and said that I should sign. If I sign it, then the matter will go. Ricky Taffa was my lawyer. I didn't know that Ricky Taffa was part of them. All to get money. They confiscated all my properties, including Rosés, all my properties, all. Even the ones I built, I built 19, the ones I built 19, 1980. All my houses, tobacco, by the schools, the, the man went and told them all the properties. Said that I should brought out that if I don't sign it, that they will go and uh, arrest my each parents. I tell them that I should sign it. Then they started pursuing my brother, my junior brother. I said, well, I don't know what you people, I didn't even know. My lawyer, whom even I believe and trusted, even forced me to sign that these people sign and, and go with their life. That was what I was saying. That these people are about to kill me, that I should sign and save my life. If, if you should, won't you sign? About uh, a month for me to come out, Roti Jacob came to prison. The judgment uh, have been delivered. And in the judgment, the judge said that before they sell any property, they should have to liaise with my lawyers. So as to get good bargain. Not just to sell, but to get good bargain. How much was the transaction? Now you say that I should have to pay. 110 million, 120 million dollars. Am I the originator? I'm just a businessman who runs through the change. How, where will I get 120 million dollars? Emmanuel Umwode had to forfeit over 15 residential and commercial properties in Lagos, Abuja, Enugu, Port Harcourt, and London. Six cars, 94 million shares in Union Bank. 4 million shares in Nigeria Bottling Company and other assets and investments. However, he also claimed that the prosecution took far more that was listed in the charge documents. 
They said he used to forfeit 93 million shares. Do you know what they took? 200 and something million shares. Including the bonuses. They went to my house, sold that money, 1.5 million dollars and 500,000 pounds. With all that valuable things. Since I came out, I went to appeal. If you go there, before you reach there, they use money and finish the matter. Before you go in there, they use money and finish because they have money. These people are poor lawyers. They now have houses in um, Banana Island, buy houses abroad, big, big houses. <coughs> when that matter ended, if you see the party, Ubundi Betro, Ubundi the true party at uh, this uh, civic center. <coughs> you know how much they pay at civic center? He threw heavy party there. Tomorrow is uh, 60th birthday. Photography alone was paid 3.6 million. They made so much money. So much money. You see him there, you see Roti Michiko, that's how you see the dead man. So, what the money they made from me. Imadal Uwude wasn't the only one with more accusations. William Ritchie, the Cochrane and Simonson families also accused auditors, PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC of fraud. This was due to the fact that the auditing firm had made six audits during the three years that the fraud took place and stated that everything was okay. <laughs> According to court documents, PwC sent in audit reports on December 31st, 1996. Two reports went out, one which the auditor certified that the Cayman branch had a mere sum of $401,000 and another stating that the Cayman branch had $94 million. Each of those reports were done by the same auditor sent to audit Banco Noriesti, but the one that had the higher sum was sent to Banco Noriesti. And with this proof of evidence, Simonson and Cochran families also dragged PwC to court. The auditors of the defense, Bryce Waterhouse, who were liable, among other things, for asserting and verifying whether the information which showed that almost half of Banco Noresti stockholders' equity was true or not, in the course of three years running and six audits, never inquired whether the money was in fact deposited in the banks as indicated in the accounting registers, or if they did. They concealed the truth regarding these available funds from their clients, Banco Noresti. Just as ordinary people have money in the bank routinely check their bank statements against the stubs of checks they issue, had the auditors merely compared the figures in the depository bank statements with Banco Noresti's accounting records, they would have already perceived the misappropriation upon their first audit of the financial statement. However, not only did they not make this comparison, but they also spelled out clearly on various occasions that the information that the funds were effectively deposited in an overseas bank at the disposal of Banco Noresti was true, as though they had really checked out the existence of such funds in the course of a serious and reliable audit. With this assurance, they tranquilized the managers, shareholders, investors, and financial market, the stock exchange, the Securities Commission, and Central Bank of Brazil, and at the same time, deluded them. Having failed to comply with so simple and routine an obligation, Price made it possible for certain employees of Banco Noresti to successfully embezzle nearly every month over a period of no less than three years, huge sums of money totaling the astonishingly equivalent in Riaz of 220 million by resorting to a very simple expedient, namely to take money from the bank's funds and or inform the accounting department that it was still there. Price's accountability because it failed to comply with the most basic procedures of any auditor's work is comparable to that of a doctor who fails to wash his hands before going into surgery and as a result infects the patient, or to that of an engineer who miscalculates projects, thereby causing a bridge to fall, or even that of a night watchman who falls asleep on the job and allows a thief to commit larceny. Emmanuel Uwude wasn't giving up his right to seek justice for the way his properties and assets were handled. 
He didn't only blame Nohori Badu and the AFCC, Babajide Ogunikpe was another person he blamed, so he sued them. He attacked not just Babajide Ogunikpe's integrity, but also accused him of outright theft. Mude was moved from Ikoi prison to Kirikiri, medium security. And one of the amusing things is that um, from the prison, he would call me. I mean, he would tell me things like, Ogunikpe, don't sell my house. He says, it's not your house. Because we took all, all his assets and we were selling, we, you know, we were selling them. And his, we sold, we sold his, um, his building there. We sold his flats in, he had a, a block of flats in, um, on Bordelon, very close to Ashiwaju's house. We sold that, we sold Anna Jemba's, hers was on Club Road, the identical buildings. Um, and Ajemba had some nice real estate in Abuja, we sold that. So we were selling stuff and sending the money to the, back to the clients. One of the things we took was a house on Osborne, number five Osborne Road, which was where he had moved, he used to live in Ikeja, and shortly before he was arrested, he moved to Ikoi. So he had this house in Ikoi, and he phoned me from prison and said I shouldn't sell it. I said, it's not your house. You know, the money that you used to acquire the house, you stole it, it's not yours. I was um, summoned by the EFCC on a complaint from Mude that I had stolen a million dollars from his house. When we took possession of it, he, as I told you, he, he would call me and beg me that I shouldn't sell his house. Eventually, when we found people who were serious and wanted to buy the property, we decided to take physical possession of the property. So um, we, we went there, the FCC went there and took possession of the property. I never set foot there, never went anywhere near it. But he got a lawyer to make a report to the EFCC after um, uh, Nuhu Ribadu had been removed from the EFCC and Mrs. Waziri was in charge made a complaint to the EFCC that I had stolen $1 million from his house. And um, I was invited by the EFCC, asked to make a statement as if I was a criminal suspect. I was on EFCC bail. And um, I decided that that sort of behavior was unacceptable, and I brought an action against the EFCC, which they didn't defend. I have a judgment against the EFCC in respect of that. But the significant thing is this, is that under the EFCC laws, upon arrest, one of the first things that is, that, that's done is that you are required to fill in a form in which you're supposed to state all your assets. If you falsely state these assets, that is a, an offense punishable upon conviction with a term of five years. Mude filled in this form, I saw it. He did not mention the existence of any $1 million in his house in Ikoi. The EFCC, rather than ask on the complaint where did you get the $1 million from? This, remember, this is a man who's been convicted of fraud. He's been convicted of fraud and sentenced. They didn't ask, where did you get the money from? Why did you not declare it on the form? They didn't ask any of these questions. They just came and started harassing me. So I, I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to stand for that, and I sued them. And knowing fully well that they, they couldn't defend the case. They presented some papers. But when it came time for trial, they never showed up. Consistently, they, they, they failed to show up. In the end, the judge got tired and heard my evidence and um, made the, the declarations that I sought and awarded costs against the FCC, 500,000, which I have not asked them to pay. In 2008, Imara Uwede had served his time and was released. 
Immediately he came out, he got his lawyers to file a case against the EFCC for the way the sale of his assets was handled. I had a chat with his current lawyer, Barrister Ilichuku. Now, on paper, they sold that property to the man for 65 million. Behind the scene, they sold it to him for 335 million. The actual value of the property is 2.5 billion. The rental value alone is 70 million. So, now, we saw documents too that showed that, no, the tenant bought it 124 million from those lawyers. Mm. And EFCC called him and said, property there for sale. Can you buy? They gave him that ridiculous 124 million. He paid and took the price, remained there. Now, in all these cases, he never disclosed that somebody else had interest. So we saw that the man that he sold it to the, the, to the buyer for on paper 65 million, and the buyer leased it back to him. So he took a lease from the buyer for 50 years at 200 naira per annum. Okay? When we now saw these documents, we knew everything was in jail. We went to the FCC. <coughs> when the FCC finished, they then asked him to ask him to bring five million to mobilize them so that they would go and arrest everybody and then we'll give them 10% of the value. Court. Till today, Emmanuel Uwede is in and out of court contesting the sale of his properties. In 2000, the Nigerian government recovered $78 million in looted funds from two former associates of the late military ruler, General Sani Abacha. One of them was Paul Uguma, the former governor of the central bank who Uwede was impersonating. The real Paul Uguma oversaw a depletion in Nigerian's foreign currency of around $3 billion. There are about 15 British companies owned and controlled by his wife, Anna Oguma, and over 20 property purchases with one worth 33 million pounds. The looting of Africa has a long legacy on the streets of Britain. Where is Amaka Anajemba today? Governor Ifani Ogwani of Enugu State has appointed a woman activist, philanthropist, politician, and graduate of political science, Mrs. Amaka M. Anajemba, as the new managing director of Enugu Waste Management Authority, ESWAMA. Mrs. Anajemba, until her appointment, was the chairperson of Door to Door for Oburuburu, Women Wing a support group and a non-governmental organization that promotes good governance in the state and works for the emancipation of indigent women and the underprivileged in the society. And she has continued to serve since then. Although Nuhu Ribadu has long left the EFCC to pursue politics, his legacy at the commission is conflicted. Inasmuch as he is presented as a modern-day Elliot Ness, he was also seen as a political tool to target any opposition to President Ulushegu Obasanjo. The EFCC is currently rife with corruption, as just this year the acting head Ibrahim Magu was suspended following allegation of fraud. In addition, a lot of the arrests don't lead to convictions and end up just being media fodder. Nigeria is known to the world as one of the countries with a high rate of financial crime, but Nigeria isn't the only country that has a high number of people involved in fraud. Nigeria currently maintains the 14th position in the world. Some of the other countries are Mexico, Ukraine, Hungary, Malaysia, Colombia, Romania, Philippines, Greece, Brazil, China, Indonesia, Russia, and Singapore. This is no excuse. But the average Nigerian youth is aware that Nigeria was colonized by the British, and with that came the pilfering of our natural reserves. And although Nigeria was given independence in the year 1960, it's been even made worse by the politicians in power, who have decided to steal the nation's resources instead of using it to make the country better. On the 6th of August 2019, 
the FBI arrested Obiwani Okeke, aka Invictus Obi, one of the Nigeria's youngest entrepreneurs, after a year-long investigation into fraud schemes that had been perpetuated by him against Ona Truck Holdings Limited, based in the United Kingdom. Obinwani Okeke was born as the 17th child to the family of Mr. Okeke, who died when Obinwani was 16. He had intercepted emails of the CFO and then posed as the CFO to make transfers of over $11 million to different accounts. He was arrested after the FBI linked the crime to him. This arrest led to the arrest of 80 people who were in a fraud ring and have led to special task forces being created to fish out fraudsters not only in America but also in Nigeria. The question here is, how do the banks not know that the amount of money getting into these accounts is fraudulent? Um, there are money laundering, anti-money laundering provisions that banks frequently ignore. I mean, think of things like this, right? We have, we have spates of kidnappings in Nigeria. Ransoms are paid. There are two things here. First of all, how is the communication was done by mobile phones? Everybody's mobile phone should be registered to an individual whose biometric information is available to someone. I don't know who keeps it. But that information is available, and certainly law enforcement can, can get that information. So there's the question that has to be asked, what's going on there? That's one. Secondly, the banks. There are laws in place with regard to cash transactions. There are laws in place with regard to re reporting requirements. If an account that doesn't see large sums of money coming into it suddenly gets a large sum of money, shouldn't banks, their reporting requirements, suspicious transactions, do they get reported? On Thursday, June 18, 2020, Obiwani Okeke changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. He pled guilty to all the charges brought against him and he would be sentenced in October of 2020. But even with Obiwani's arrest, this has not stopped fraudsters from going about their businesses. Another fraudster who was recently caught by the EFCC is Ismail Mustafa, aka Momfa. He was arrested on the 10th of June 2019 and charged with 14 counts of fraud, money laundering and running a foreign exchange business without the authorization of the Central Bank of Nigeria. He was later granted a bail of 10 million naira. His case is still in court pending when the trial will start. In an operation called Fox Hunt 2, the Dubai police carried out a four-month investigation into the life of Nigerian fraudster called Ramoni Abbas, also known as Hush Puppy. Hush Puppy is said to have duped over 1,926,400 victims, and at the time of his arrest, he's said to be worth over a billion dirhams. During the Dubai police investigations, it was discovered that Hush Puppy hacked corporate emails and cloned websites to redirect payments to his own accounts. In 1983, the gifted Nigerian writer Chinu Achebe wrote, Nigerians are corrupt because the system under which they live today makes corruption easy and profitable. They will cease to be corrupt when corruption is difficult and inconvenient. The trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a failure of leadership. There is nothing basically wrong with the Nigerian character. I am saying that Nigeria can change today if she discovers leaders who have the will, the ability, and the vision. This concludes season one of 23419, and we say be safe, smart, and aware. We're not quite sure when the next season will begin, but we promise to bring a most entertaining case. So thank you for listening to this podcast and subscribe so you'll be the first to know when the next season drops. Hopefully like second quarter or first quarter next year. But anyways, we'll let you know. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to discuss with me, share your stories, please send me a DM on Twitter at CH10MA. 
CH10MA. Look forward to connecting with you. Singer songwriter Timmy Dakolo crashed the recording of this episode to wish you all a Merry Christmas. All of us are for this country. My children's going to 419 me this morning. Say school bus money has finished. Sorry, guys, that, that's my mad friend, but she'll be okay. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Just like the ones I used to know, where the tree tops glisten and children listen to hear sleigh bells in the snow. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas with. Every Christmas card I write May your days be merry And bright And may all your Christmases be white <laughs> This season of 23419 was created, researched, and narrated by Choma Unyewe. Podcast cover designed by Ned Oji. Co-written by Esther Kokori. Sound designed by Hova Digital Sound and co-produced by Ruth Dulak. It was brought to you by Racketeer Productions. So please send us your stories, messages, thoughts, and prayers to 23419podcast at gmail.com. Till next time, stay safe.